I'm Luke Nicholas from Epic Brewing Company in New Zealand. The brewery is based in Auckland, which is the largest city in New Zealand with uh, 1.4 million people. It's located near the top of the North Island. It's not the same as other places. New Zealand's a long way away. It's um, at the edge of the world. There's a lot of movies that, as a New Zealander, when you watch them and they have like a, a map on the wall or something, there will be a lot of times where New Zealand's actually left off the map because I don't know why, because it, maybe it's the size and you just chop the edge off, oh, it's just New Zealand. No one ever goes there, it's, it's such a long way away, which is really nice. So we don't have a lot of people and um, yeah, it's got a lot of sheep and some kiwi fruit and some apples. It's, um, yeah, it's very agricultural based. Um, yeah, where am I going with this? New Zealand's small, it's like, it's a country. Yes, we've got an airline, but, <laughs> and our own beer, so. If you want to know about New Zealand, go to Wikipedia. <laughs> I went to school for a year in Sacramento, California. While I was there, I discovered craft beer because I had some friends that were going to school in Chico. Went to visit them a couple of times and while you were there, it's like, well, you go to the pub and you drink some beer. And they had a beer that was very hoppy and had a lot of bitterness, which my palate wasn't used to because I was coming from New Zealand, it was, there wasn't a lot of choice. I'd been home brewing for a couple of years um, before I came over and home brewing was just consisted of the kits and with the extract and add the water and the yeast and away you go and you've got cheap beer. But when I came back um, I found that I was looking for beer that had flavour like I'd discovered in California and I couldn't find it anywhere. I, drank, I think I drank pretty much every imported beer which was probably a total of um, 10 or 12 at that stage in New Zealand. No, just kidding, it was more than that. After I graduated, I ended up with a job in exporting and that company had an office in LA and I had married a Californian and she was from Long Beach so it was a logical step to, to move back to California. It was easy for me to get a green card and I worked in LA for a year but while I was working I also got into home brewing quite obsessively you could say. I was also amongst that visiting um, all the the local breweries and brew pubs and microbreweries and just talking to the brewers and um, there was one particular occasion where we had a guy come from, I think it was Huntington Beach Brewing Company, to the home brew club. But this guy said something which I never even thought about. Someone said, how do you become a brewer? He said, go down to your local brewery and ask for a job. I went, wow, what a brilliant idea. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? So a few months later, I ended up um, not because of that, but I ended up back in New Zealand. Um, the reason was my wife missed New Zealand, which is kind of cool. So um, we ended up um, back there and a little brew pub had opened and um, I went down and asked for a job. They went, no. I went down pretty much every weekend for a year and I helped out in the brewery and cleaned tanks and painted the floor and stuff and they said, you seem pretty interested and pretty keen at this since you've been down every weekend and you've even come during the week and taken sick days off the job I, I actually had and come and brew with them so they actually took me on. I started out as an assistant brewer. Within a few months I became the head brewer by default after the head brewer left so that was a uh, exciting sort of being thrown in the deep end and uh, worked for the brew pub for about three years. Went out of my well, went out and started um, a website which ultimately got acquired by realbear.com. So I was working for realbear.com. They were going to do an IPO right about the time the NASDAQ crash happened in 2001. And um, after that happened, the IPO didn't happen and um, they decided to uh, shed all their employees from around the world and just focus on California. I was um, part of them in Australia and New Zealand running their, uh, I guess, their division down there. And once they said, well, you're on your own, I had to find some other sources of income. So I went back to my previous job at the brew pub and helped them out with um, specialty brews, seasonal beers, and um, quality assurance. As the uh, brew pub got bigger and more popular, they decided to open more pubs. So as they opened more pubs, they needed a bigger brewery. So as part of, I guess, their, their growth. They acquired a, a bigger brewery that was in Auckland, but was uh, not doing very well financially. And they said, well, we want you to come on full time as head brewer and general manager of that business, which was, became their production brewery. But the brewery was four times the size of um, the existing brewery. So we sort of went in there with uh, 
being way, way underutilised on the equipment and it also had a, had a packaging line but we weren't bottling beer. I was put in charge of sort of basically you take care of this and we'll give you three things that you need to do. You don't run out of beer, win awards and be profitable. Well the first two came pretty naturally but um, the being profitable was pretty tough considering we were probably using about 10% of the capacity of the equipment that we had. So I would said well why don't we make our own bottled beer, make a different brand from the pubs because the pubs were, were sort of, it was all about the on-premise experience, it was about dining and, and the beer inside the, the walls of the pub and we'd seen other um, brew pubs try and bottle their beer and put it out into the marketplace and it hadn't really gone that well so we thought we wanted to create a brand that was quite separate from the um, pub brand. And then we got thinking, well, New Zealand's a very small market, there's only four million people. Craft beer hadn't really even got it established properly. And um, so we decided to come up with a brand that we could export around the world. And it needed to be, it needed to come up with a word that summed up, I guess, the style of brewing that I like to brew, which is quite big flavoured beers. So we came up with the word epic. Epic was the challenge that we had ahead of us to tackle the two big players in the market that own 90% of beer sales. So coming in and competing with them, they were quite aggressive to, to keep um, players out of the market. And then the other thing that tied New Zealand into the, the epic word was everyone that's ever travelled to New Zealand has gone on an epic journey, whether it be by plane, it's a long way across the Pacific, whether it be by boat, being the, um, I guess, the European immigrants that came, or even by canoe when the, uh, the Maori people came south from the, the Pacific Islands. It was, um, it was an epic journey. It was just that epicness about New Zealand and the scenery and the extreme sports and, and being at the edge of the world, I guess, it was, uh, it's an epic distance from anywhere. So that, that was the, the whole sort of essence of how we came up with the brand. In the early days, I, I started making sort of American-style pale ales and putting them out through the brew pub and people were just freaking out, just going, whoa, so much flavour. By the time Epic was born in 2005, the market hadn't really moved that much further forward. Or maybe my brewing had and I was adding a lot more hops to my American Pale Ale. In 2006, when we officially launched the beer, it won Supreme Champion Beer of New Zealand and um, we went to market with it. Didn't really have a plan, we didn't have a sales team for the bottled beer. Then I was like, well, how are we going to sell this? And I was like, mm, I don't know, we'll get our friends and family to buy it. After winning Supreme Champion, well, the phone just rang hot and we just started brewing. And it was sort of an, an easy step into the market because everyone wanted it. After about 18 months, the owners of the pubs and the brewery decided um, that they didn't want a bottled um, brand anymore because it was going to cost money that they would rather spend on opening more pubs. And they said, basically, just take the packaging material and you can throw it in the recycle bin. We're going to like wash our hands of this and be done with it. And I turned around and said, well, I'd like to buy the brand off you. And I think they had a bit of a chuckle and a laugh and thought that, why would you want to do that? Because it's going to cost money. It's like, well, anything costs money. I said, well, I buy it off you on the condition that we have a manufacturing agreement, meaning that I can continue to use your brewery to make my beer and a supply agreement to supply the beer to the pubs because there's no way I was going to be able to sort of start on day one where 90% of the sales of um, the Epic Pale Ale was going through their pubs that I'd be able to support or be able to make a living out of it but um, it worked out so um, I purchased the brand in 2007, went out on my own. Well, at that stage we also had Epic Lager which we'd just released which was sort of a token gesture to the 90% of the population that sort of found the Epic Pale Ale as face meltingly hoppy. So it's a dry hopped lager which sort of sat between sort of green bottled bland beers that everyone was drinking and the Epic Pale Ale. It's not a craft beer drinker's dream, but it's um, it's sort of a it's a gateway beer into the Epic brand that has it sells itself. It's never been promoted. It just gets sucked along as people discover the brand and they try that, and then they step into the pale ale and, and work their way up the the range of beers into more hoppy and more bitter beers and beers with more flavour. I have been termed a one-trick pony because I just make pale ales and IPAs and double IPAs, even though I have made other other beers and. Each year I, I come out with um, an interpretation of a stout and I, I have it as a vintage and I, I build it in a way with malts and stuff that the, the beer will age and it will change with, with time and um, become more interesting as time goes on hopefully. Yeah, there was a beer blogger uh, a couple of years ago that uh, wrote a, it was nearly a bit of a nasty um, post, sort of a bit of a backhanded comment calling me a one trick pony but it was at the time when I'd just done the, the Port Amarillo beer with um, 
dogfish head and he was excited that I'd actually broken out of the, the, the hoppy bears that I was making. I actually took his tagline, One Trick Pony, and I put it on a, a label of um, a, a bottle which was for our Zythos, which was, it was a hop blend, but it was a, it was a single hop use, so that hop was used all the way through um, the process. And in 2013, came out with um, the Mosaic, which is a single hop, so now I've decided that the One Trick Pony series will be uh, a single hop variety. It'll be the same recipe. So it's the same malt base and um, we just changed the hop variety out so people can actually get the, the beers and compare them side by side and actually look at the hop varieties so they can compare them and say okay well it's the same beer but just by changing the hop look how different it can taste. And also one trick pony was it was sort of adding a second IPA to the family of beers that we had and uh, last year I actually had five IPAs in the family which was uh, a lot of fun for me a lot of people enjoyed it too. And the reason I did that was because I had a bit of a, an epiphany moment when I was in Portland, Oregon a few years ago and I visited Laurelwood and um, I went and said, oh, can I have a flight of um, your beers so I can taste them? He said, sure, do you want a regular um, flight or the, the IPA flight? I'm like, what's an IPA flight? They said, well, we've got six IPAs on. I'm like, you've got six IPAs? What a great idea. I'm going to start making multiple IPAs because there are so many different variants and there's so many different hops so that was my turning point on thinking well I can have more than one IPA. Currently I've got um, two American style IPAs, an English IPA, a New Zealand style IPA and a double IPA so there's my five IPAs. The double IPA is called Hop Zombie. It's a lot of fun, it's, it's very very pale. People when they look at it in the glass they um, think that it's like a, a Pilsner or a light lager because it's sort of such a pale yellow colour and um, but then they smell it and it's uh, pretty intense and then they taste it and then they realize that it's pretty special and then after a bottle of it they can see where the zombie part comes from because it's eight and a half percent alcohol and it just seems to be a little bit too easy to drink very well balanced and um, yummy yes there are new beers coming there's always new beers coming I like traveling especially to the US to, to see what's happening there's just so much choice and so many breweries now that it's, uh, it's always inspiring. Um, the problem, I guess, with New Zealand being so small and we've only got 60 um, craft breweries is that um, it's pretty easy to taste all those beers and you can pretty much taste them as soon as they come out and then that's it. You've tasted everything there is. So it's always exciting to get imports. A lot of stuff that comes in is can be a bit old and tired and it's sort of come through sort of a grade channels you could say, not official so the beer's never in, in the best condition which, which is a problem. The demand's there in New Zealand but the population is so small that um, breweries just aren't bothered to, to send a pallet or two to, to New Zealand and trying to develop a market in such a small market it's um, yeah not that great. Compared to Australia, New Zealand brewers seem to be a lot more further forward and I'm not sure why the they're taking more risks, the beers seem to be bigger in flavour, they seem to be better in quality and I'm not sure what it is about Australia, maybe they're just a little bit further behind in um, taking risks. Maybe it's because New Zealand's so far away that we need to export to make our businesses viable. So to do that and compete in a global market, our beers have to be world class, they have to be um, challenging in flavour to capture people's attention because there's um, so much available out there now and they have to be unique and I guess coming from New Zealand there's a pretty good point of difference and with the access to, to local ingredients from New Zealand like our hops and our malt that gives, gives the flavour in the beers um, I guess a, a point of difference as well because of um, different growing conditions bring through different flavours. When I made the first batch being the New Zealand style IPA I made last year it was called first batch because it used the newly named Wymere hop so it was, the, it was the first commercial beer released with that hop in it. So I used 100 kilos to make it, which was it's, it's quite hoppy. I had people were really loving this. Um, New Zealand hops took it to Brau in Germany, the festival there, and they impressed a lot of people with for that hop. But then that created demand for it. I turned around, and went, okay, well 100 kilos was good. How much more can I have? They said, well we only grew 500 kilos. I'm like, well can I have the other 400? No, I've already sold it. I'm like, well I want to make this beer all year round because I think this is a great hop. And I went, well. I said, how much are you going to make next year? They said, oh, probably a thousand kilos. I said, can I have all of that? No. 
So it's it's hard, I guess, sort of the size I'm at now and with export. It's um, New Zealand's a small country and there's only 17 growers and it's a, it's a small region and it's the same problem everywhere in the world with growing hops. Everyone wants the, the latest, newest thing but no one really wants to commit to contracts for three to five years to, to make it worth the growers while to, to grow something because they don't want to be growing the, the latest, greatest hop and then the, the market changes and says, well, we don't want that anymore. But I think as market prices increase for New Zealand hops because the demand's obviously there, that it'll make it worthwhile for a new generation of younger farmers to come in and invest in hops. Coming out of New Zealand, there's some great new varieties and stuff, but it's just the market forces haven't pushed it in the direction that we, we've got this new generation prepared to invest in, in growing hops in New Zealand. But it will come.